Here are some thoughts about intersecting two surfaces in three-dimensional space. This was, um, I wanted to talk about this because it has to do, well, the way, way we approached it in our class was when you've got Lagrange multipliers with one constraint, we talked a bit Maybe I'll make a video about that as well. We talked a bit about the fact that the gradient of the function you're using for the constraint has to not vanish at the points you're interested in on the constraint set, or else things go haywire. And the basic idea there was it's the difference between, for example, a circle where the gradient of the function x squared plus y squared is never 0 on that set, and let's say the axes expressed as x, y equals 0. Here the gradient does vanish here at the origin. And that's why this is a nice smooth surface and this has a singularity, a point where it does not look just like a little bit of a bent straight line. And it turns out that that's the, the crucial condition for a level set of a function to look nice, is that on the entire level set if we know the gradient is never zero, then it's going to look smooth like this. And it has to do with um, implicit, the implicit function theorem, basically. What about two constraints? What if you have two constraints? In other words, let's say these constraints are g of x, y, z, let's say it's in three dimensions, although it's not really going to be crucial that it's in three dimensions, is equal to, let's say, some constant a k and h of x, y, z is equal to L. So for example, these two guys, the sphere of radius root 6, that's the green, and then a plane cutting through, and you see the intersection curve, a, a, a circle cut into that sphere that's going to be the constraint set for could be the, could be the constraint set for a lagrange multiplier problem and then the question i'm not going to actually do a particular lagrange multiplier problem there but the question was what is the analog of the gradient uh, not being zero condition when you have two functions and you're looking at the intersection of the level sets of those two guys well let's look at um, what we consider when it, it really is related to the lagrange multiplier problem Let's see, I'll erase this. I still want my nice picture. If you are optimizing, finding the extrema of some other function, the objective function f of x, y, z, then what you do in the Lagrange multiplier setup for two constraints is you look for points where the gradient of f is a linear combination of the gradient of g and the gradient of h. And what we expect is that that is going to be a plane. So that we're looking at this is a specific plane determined by the gradients of g and h, the constraint functions. And we want the gradient of our op objective function to lie in that plane. Well, is this guaranteed to be a plane? Not always. Not in a certain case where, for example, well, basically the only example, where gradient of g and gradient of h are, par are parallel. So here, for example, the gradient of, let me use the colors in the, in the picture. Here's the gradient of the sphere function. That's perpendicular to the sphere. And then here's the gradient of the function that's determining the plane, the linear function here. So let's actually, let's write those in. Let's call those h of x, y, z. Oops to give them their names, and let's call this G. Forgot to name them before. Okay. So, if those are not, let's look at what happens. With the generic situation, the nice situation is going to be where these are not parallel. Okay. Well, that's going to be where the tangent planes to these surfaces. Now, this thing is a plane itself, this first one. And then the other one has a tangent plane like this. It's where those tangent planes are not parallel. 
in other words, the surfaces are not tangent to each other. Okay, and so what it looks like we're looking for is a, the condition that the surfaces are not. I'm just got a lot of stuff in here, not tangent to each other. If they are tangent to each other, let's see what happens. Do we expect, if I have two surfaces that are come together and are tangent to each other, do I expect the intersection to be a nice curve, which is the situation we'd like to see? Well, here's a situation where they are tangent to each other. I've taken the same sphere, but now I've changed the plane to be exactly the tangent plane to the sphere. And in that case, we're getting something you can just barely see. There's a tiny little green point here. That's the whole intersection of these two surfaces is just the point of tangency. So let's look at the uh, the actual gradients here. So um, let's look at a specific point, 1 comma 1 comma 2. And that's a point that's on the both intersections, it turns out. Okay, The intersection where it's, uh, where it's a nice curve and then where it was tangent. So let's look at the gradient of G. That's equal to 2x, 2y, 2z. And so that's going to be 2, 2, 4. In the first example, where they do cut, this one here, the gradient of h is just minus 1, minus 2, 1. It's just the normal vector. And these are definitely not parallel. Okay, And so what that says is that these guys are cutting through each other in a nice way, in a way that's not going to give some sort of degenerate example. You've got the, the plane cutting through for h uh, equals a constant, and then the tangent plane to the sphere is in a very different direction. This is called what's called a transverse intersection. And very often, when you use calculus um, in higher dimensions, transversality is something that's a really crucial condition. And it just means that they're cutting through each other so that they, there's not degenerate. They don't have some sort of um, intersection that you wouldn't expect. And in this case, it's a condition that the tangent planes are not parallel or equivalently that the gradients are not parallel. Very easy to check. Um, if you had the other example, here, I specifically picked it to be the tangent plane. And in that case, this guy changes the gradient of this new version of the function h is 1, 1, 2. And these guys are parallel. And that's why we get a very different intersection. We do not get um, a nice curve. We just get a point. And if we tried to use the Lagrange multiplier method here, that could really mess up because these two vectors are not spanning a plane. If you put lambda in front of this and mu in front of this, you're still just getting a line here. And that's not what we expect from the, from the general situation. Let me phrase it in yet another way that is um, really interesting. So let's, let's, first of all, let's see, I think I can actually erase this. I've still got the picture on the computer picture anyway. Let me start, start making a list of the, the equivalent conditions, okay? So g equals k, that level set, and h equals l, that's an h, intersect transversely at point p when, let's see, well, one of the conditions was that the gradient of g and the gradient of h are not parallel at p, or just translating that into a little more sophisticated language, the gradient of g and the gradient of h, that set of vectors, is linearly independent. That's a good linear algebra notion. Or three, that... Um, they span a plane. Um, the span of that, insert a little span there, is a plane, two-dimensional, not just one. 
And that's, that's just a linear algebra equivalence, that when two vectors are linear, linearly independent, they span as big a span as they can. When any set of vectors is linearly independent, they span as big a set as they could possibly span, the highest dimensional space. Well, let me look at this. This is having these two guys separated out as two vectors. Let's put them together. I wish, well, we'll have to remember that that's the overarching thing here. Um, let's put them together. For example, we had this, uh, these two vectors, two, it was two, two, four, and minus one, minus two, one. Let's have put them together in a matrix. So we have the gradient of G and the gradient of H together in a two by three matrix. What can we say about that? Well, what we can say is that these rows, after all, those are just the gradient vectors, are linearly independent. Or if we want to use a notion that's a little more advanced, there's this wonderful, wonderfully well-behaved notion of the rank of a matrix, which is the maximum number of linearly independent dimensions. Uh, linearly independent rows, for example, the rank of this matrix equals 2, and that's as big as it could possibly be. Okay, and so that's a very nice way to say it. If we put this together in a matrix, it has to have maximal rank. And yet another way to say that is that if we think of this as a linear transformation, that's going to be on to. Remember, if I have um, the rows are linearly independent, or equivalently, if, if when I reduce it, I get two pivots, a pivot in every row, then that linear transformation is going to be on to. I guess I'm going to have to erase these. You can always re rewind. So this is, I guess, number four, condition number four, or this is condition number five, equivalent to condition number five. And number six is that if I look at this transformation, if I think of this as multiplying like a vector, that gives me a, uh, oops, ABC. That gives me a vector in R2, then this transformation is on to. So that's yet another condition. And now let's see why would I why would I think of this as a linear transformation? Well, what I could do is I can look, I could create like some other function. Let's call it um, t of x y z. If I've got these two functions, x or h and g and h rather. then I can create one function, a mapping, from R3 to R2, which encapsulates all of the constraint information. It's really, the constraint really is not two separate functions from this point of view. It's one function that just happens to have two components as its values, something in R2. And then what I'm looking at is I'm looking at the set of x, y, z. The constraint set is all the inputs such that t of x, y, z is equal to the pair KL, the two values that I wanted. That's a very tidy way to say it. Okay, So what I've got here is a function from R3 to R2. And for every point in R3, we get a point here, namely, x squared plus y squared plus z squared comma minus x minus 2y plus z. So in our example, and you know what? Let me write everything in terms of column vectors to emphasize the linear algebra connection. So here it's not a linear transformation, but soon enough we're going to relate this kind of stuff to linear transformations. And I'm looking at the set of inputs where this, these two functions give me the values 6 and minus 1. So I'm looking at all the solutions to what are the interesting, what are the inputs that produce this specific output? Well, it turns out, in this case, it's this circle that was the intersection of the sphere and the plane. And what is the condition? The condition is if I look at the matrix of derivatives of this transformation, often called dt, that's exactly the gradient of the first function and the gradient of the second function. That's exactly 2x, 2y, 2z, minus 1, minus 2, 1. And it's this guy 
that had to be onto as a transformation. So it turns out that a very slick way to think about this relates to some beautiful, beautiful stuff is that if I think of the constraint function as a single function with an R2 value, and I look at the matrix of derivatives of that guy, the condition is that that needs to be onto. And it turns out that's the theorem, is that if that's onto, then the constraint set that you've built out of that, all the inputs that go to a specific output, is going to be a nice, smooth set.